want to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 is where we're going to begin today. you to uh, follow, be following along uh, in your devotional books. There's plenty on the back counter there, and uh, so I'd encourage you to follow along in those and uh, be reading. Um, some of it you will find, I repeat a little bit on Sunday morning, but if you don't realize, we need to repeat things because we tend to forget things. Uh, we don't always remember things, and the more we hear things, the more it sinks in, and sometimes a different thing. So I love the fact that you'll be reading along in Scripture, and uh, I will be speaking about that on Sunday, so that way you're familiar already, many of you are already with the passage, uh, you've read it, you've studied it, you've looked through it, and you're ready to receive the Word of God. How many of you have ever driven through the night? You don't have to raise your hand, but you've taken a trip and you don't want to stop anywhere, so you drive through the night. Now, many of you would probably say, when I was younger, I used to do that, and now that I'm older, I'm not really interested in that. Amen. And uh, you know, as, as I'm getting a little bit older, I find that too, where when I was younger, I just do it, and now it's like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do that. Uh, this is sound is thrilling to me. But I have a few times driven throughout the night when I've gone somewhere, maybe taking a trip out to out west with the kids or down to Florida. And you just don't want to spend all that time on the road, especially with a bunch of kids in the car. I used to love driving at night because they would all be quiet and fall asleep eventually. And that was my favorite time to drive. Uh, nowadays it doesn't matter because they all have their own little devices and they just put their headphones in and we don't hear them anyways, they don't hear us. Uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, I guess, but uh, when you're taking long trips, it, it's not so bad. But I have found when I have driven throughout the night, one of the most difficult times for me is about 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, you're headed pretty good, and about 3 o'clock you start to get tired, and then 4 o'clock it just seems like the night stretches on. Between that 4 and 5 o'clock, and then in the summer, normally about 5 o'clock, you just start to see some new light coming up. And then as that gets brighter and brighter, it becomes easier. But to me, when I've driven before and gone through the night and hit that 3, 4, 4.30, 5 o'clock, you're just hoping to see light. Because it just seems so dark. And when that light comes, they give that ray of hope. And there's that sense of, okay, I know I can do this. Getting light, it's going to get easier. We're going to see this morning how when Paul lived, he expresses this ray of hope. This light of hope that he is able to see. And remind us of the need and the great importance of hope. First thing I want to see this morning is that future hope helps us through today's challenges. When we don't have future hope, a future vision, today's challenges often seem so difficult. I've been working with a, a man that seems to be going through a lot of challenges, and I'm, I'm trying to ask him, what, what is your vision for the future? And he says, well, I don't really have a vision for the future. I'm so worried about fixing things today. And you know, sadly, he's going to live in a hopeless state for a long time. Because if you have no vision of where you want to be or what's going to happen, basically you're going to be stuck in your present day misery, and that will continue on. But what Paul understood was that earthly suffering resulted in eternal glory. He realized that what he was going through on this earth would not last. It was temporary. And all of us, at times, will go through suffering. Maybe you've experienced the loss of a loved one, the loss of a very close loved one. 
And though you never completely get over that, things change and it's not so hard. I remember when my dad passed away, passed away suddenly of a, uh, of a heart attack right before he was uh, 52. Now I will say this, when I was a kid, not a kid, but when I was, I was 23 probably when my dad passed away. And I thought when my dad passed away at 51, almost 52, I thought, well, you know, he's lived a pretty good, long, full life. And now that I just this last week turned 46, I'm thinking 52, <laughs> that's young. What was I thinking back then? But you know, when we come to those tragedies, I remember my mom for, you know, first weeks and really first months and even the first year, year and a half, it was just so hard for her. And then step by step, after time, it got better and easier. She still misses my dad after almost 20 years. But yet things change. We've all experienced that in life. And sometimes in this life, we might have things that get worse and worse, especially those who are nearing the end of their early life. It may not get better in this life. Paul is probably on death row. Knowing that it probably will not get better. Now, some people think that Paul ended up going to Spain and uh, ministering there. Other people think that he ended up getting killed uh, there in Rome. We are not sure. But he knew that there wasn't much hope for him on this world. But what does he say? Verse 10 here of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul says, I am willing to endure whatever. Whatever comes my way, I will endure it. For what? For the sake of the elect. Now, this is an interesting term here. It's used in Scripture. Maybe you have, uh, in your Scripture, it might say the chosen ones, for those who are chosen. Now, there's a lot of theological arguments that go around this idea of what's called election. It is something that Scripture teaches, but not necessarily the way that some religions teach it. Some people teach in the idea of election means that God has chosen everybody who is going to become a believer, and nobody will become a believer except the ones who God has chosen. And there is some truth to that, but the fact is, we don't know who God has chosen. And the other factor is this. When the Bible talks about somebody being chosen or elect, it's not for me to sit there and say, oh, Oh, that person's chosen by God, but I don't think God would choose that person. That's not for me to do. The idea of God choosing us is an encouraging thing given to us. The reason I believe election and being chosen is mentioned to say God chose us though we didn't deserve it. Whenever Paul mentions this and encourages it, the idea of being elect is the idea of not a prideful thing to say, oh, look, I'm better than everybody else because God chose me. But Paul uses in the reference, like, I was not deserving of anything, and yet God still chose me. That's the picture here. And even Paul says, look, I'm willing to suffer so that other people can come to know Jesus and be special to God as his children too. That's the picture he gives here of election. Yes, we can't understand it. God knows exactly who's going to trust in him. He knows everything. But here Paul says, I am willing to endure whatever it takes. So others can come to know Jesus. So others can have what I have. And then he goes on to describe how earthly death results in life. Verse 11. This saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. Jesus taught us something very similar in John chapter 12. 
He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies and bears much fruit, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What Jesus is saying, and really what Paul is expressing, is just repeating what Jesus said, is the idea of in order to have a new plant produce, a seed first has to fall down and die. Many of you know, and I can't remember exactly what type of tree it is, but there's certain types of trees that have to have the seed, a uh, pine tree. Um, I think maybe it's a ponderosa, I can't remember. And what needs for those seeds to germinate is really for fire to come through. And as fire comes through, the seeds start to germinate, and as these acorns, or not acorns, but these pine cones die, it produces new life. Jesus used that illustration. Paul says, look here, for death to happen in order for life to take place. Well, what does he mean by this? It could be two things. If you read my devotional book this last week, you see I kind of presented both ideas, one and one, a spot one and the other, because I'm kind of torn exactly what he means, and I think both can be supported by the scriptures. The first is the idea of Paul says, I must physically die in order to experience real life, real eternal life. It comes after physical death. Paul says, I don't fear physical death because I know to be absent from the body is present from the Lord. At the same time, Jesus also tells us that when we die to ourself and our selfish desires and what we want and what we cling to, that's where we try and find true life on this earth. And the fact is, is death, either death to ourself or physical death must take place before we experience the greatness of life either on this earth or in eternal glory. And we also see that earthly endurance results in future exaltation. What does he say in verse 12? If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we endure, we will reign with Jesus. Endurance is an idea that's presented over and over and over in Scripture. Because there will be a time where things will be hard for us. Now, in general, we've had it good in the United States to be able to openly worship God and freely worship Him. But there are times, and there will be a time down the road, we may experience, we may not, where we will have to endure persecution, deep persecution for our faith. But it reminds us, look, if you endure, there's great hope waiting for you at the end. That if you're willing to suffer, if you're willing to continue on, you'll reign with him. Now I mentioned this in the devotional book this week, but just want to clarify this. And that you're reigning with Christ. Most of the time when we hear reigning with Christ, oh, who are we going to reign over? We get the idea like, oh, that'd be nice. I'd like to be Lord over someone. That's not really the idea presented here. Reign with Christ means that we are going to have an exalted position. But everybody else is going to have an exalted position too. Now in our day and age, it's a little bit harder to understand this because most of us would be considered middle class. In those days, in Bible days, they didn't have much middle class. They had lords and they had servants. There was some middle class, but most people either lived basically kind of day-to-day -day serving others, or they were in charge of things, and they were lord over properties. And the idea here is that we're going to reign with Christ means we're not going to live eternal life as some type of subservient servant, but we will be in an exalted position, a special position. Really, almost you would say like a middle class type of position. Not ruling over all these people under us, but the idea is, is as believers, we will have this place in heaven that's a positive place. 
But we also see letter D, that earthly denial results in heavenly rejection. Look at verse 12, the end of it. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now, there is some debate about this. But to me, I think this presents the opposite of enduring. We endure through trials and difficulties. We'll reap eternal glory. But if we deny, if we turn from the faith, he says, he will deny us. Jesus says something similar here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. And whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Jesus says, if we acknowledge Jesus, if we're willing to endure, and as be, be believers, true believers will endure. Now this often brings a question up. That, does this mean that somebody can lose their salvation? What if somebody at one time followed Jesus Christ, but now they deny Jesus Christ? Are they still saved or not saved? My general answer is simply this. If we deny Christ, like live in a lifestyle that denies Christ, even though at one time we were presenting that we were following Christ, my general understanding is that that person is really not a believer in the first place. They hooked on to be part of a religion. They hooked on to be part of, they liked what Jesus was doing, kind of like the parable of the, the, uh, the seeds, the parable of the soils that Jesus gave. Here he says, if we deny him, he will deny us. The fact is, is not everybody who claims the name of Christ is an actual believer, and it's often persecution and difficult time that sets true believers apart from false believers. Do you remember in the New Testament, after the death of Ananias and Sapphira, it said many people joined them because they saw the power of God, but also says many people were scared because they realized the power of God. Basically, it causes clear separation. One of the negatives, I believe, about the freedom we have in the United States is it creates a lot of mediocre Christianity. Where people name the name of Christ, call themselves Christians, but yet have not had their lives and hearts transformed by the power of the Word of God, have never become true believers. Because it's easy to float. It's easy to come in church, feel good about ourselves, be religious, but have never surrendered to Jesus Christ. Where we do have people being persecuted, it's pretty hard to be a, a fake believer if you know you're going to be possibly beaten for your faith. Positive about being free, but there's also the negatives. And Jesus says, look, if you deny me, I will deny you. Now, this doesn't mean that, for instance, like the, the Apostle Peter, when he denied Jesus and he felt so guilty and he understood and yet Jesus forgave him. Doesn't mean if all of a sudden somebody asks us a question and we give a wrong answer or we, we maybe fake something at another time and we feel guilty about it and ask forgiveness. It's not like a one-time denial. It's the idea of an act of choice that I'm no longer going to associate with Jesus Christ and his followers. That's a denial. Now, most people aren't going to say, I deny Jesus Christ. I have a relative. This relative grew up going to a Christian school, a Christian home, went to church growing up. But he has come to the point that he doesn't really like the Christian faith. He likes some of the Christian principles. But he's gone into the idea of some Buddhism and some New Age stuff and really has rejected the faith. He's denied what God has said. At one time, he would have claimed to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but his lifestyle has now denied it. That claim at first was not a full understanding of what it meant to be a follower. Then he goes out further in verse 13. He says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Now there's a couple different thoughts of this passage. 
It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Now, there are other scripture passages that can support this. This is encouraging. There are times when we don't have the faith. We don't really have the trust in God. We ask God, I'm struggling with this faith. Help me to trust you. I don't think this is what this is referring to. But when we sometimes lack faith, God will help give that to us and give us the grace and mercy. But I think this passage refers to those who choose to reject the faith. Because of the context, it even says that even if we are faithless, he is faithful because he cannot deny himself. If we choose to be faithless, in a sense, we choose to reject our faith. God's not just going to say, well, you know, I realize you wanted to follow me at one time. I'm going to let you into my heaven. Matthew chapter 7. Many people will say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied and done all these things in your name? And God's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. He cannot deny himself. He has set up an example. This is the way to heaven. There is one way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We must have faith in Jesus Christ and him alone to remove our sins. We must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. He says that is the only way because he has to remain faithful to his word. He cannot deny himself. Paul talked a little bit about this in Romans chapter 3. He says, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithful, faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone else were a liar. As it is written, that you may, not, or that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. This is in the context of the Israelites. He says, what about the Israelites? If some of them chose not to be faithful to God, does that mean God's going to reject all Israelites? No, because God's going to keep his promises, but yet those who are faithless will not find their eternal home with the faithful God. Paul then reverts back to the Word of God, the importance of the Word of God. And that's where we see that being students of God's word will keep us spiritually grounded. We've seen this in 1 Timothy. We've seen it in 2 Timothy. Paul challenges Timothy, look, hold to the word. Hold to the word. Hold to the word. I've been dealing with a man lately, and, and as I try to help this guy, I keep trying to direct him to the word of God. And he wants to hold on to some type of mystical Spirit, often referring to him as the Holy Spirit. And he wants the Holy Spirit to tell him what to do all the time. And I try to get him to see that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak apart from the Word of God. He speaks through the Word of God. Paul doesn't emphasize the Spirit. This is one of my concerns I have with even a charismatic movement. And I'm not putting all charismatics in this. But it's a concern I have. Because there's a great emphasis on everything on the Spirit and often a very little emphasis on the Word of God. And the Word of God, Paul here doesn't emphasize to Timothy, you know, uh, let the Holy Spirit speak, let the Holy Spirit speak, let the Holy Spirit speak. That's, that's important to do. But Paul emphasizes to Timothy, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Spirit will direct you in the Word of God. And that's what he does here. He talks about the importance of being grounded, being stable. Scripture often talks about it, even in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel peace. In those days when soldiers would go to fight, they would have cleats on the bottom of their shoes. That when they were in the mud and the muck of battle, those cleats could help them get the solid foundation. That's what the Word of God is. Letter A. We should avoid fighting over words. Look at verse 14. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good but only ruins the hearers. 
Now, it's very interesting if you look at the way translations work. Most of you understand that the New Testament was written mainly in Greek, but some Aramaic as well. And when you're translating words, sometimes it's, it's hard to translate kind of one word or one way. And the Greek word, it's one word, but it's translated to us in the way it says, uh, depends what version you have, but it says quarrel about words or argue about words is actually one Greek word. And the idea here, the Greek word, has the idea of don't fight or argue over this human thinking or these human words, how it goes all together. Don't use human thinking. That's what he's saying. Don't argue over technicalities found in the scripture or other things that seem or sound better. Because what it does, it brings ruin to the hearers. It causes confusion. It doesn't cause clarity. So he's challenging Timothy. Only speak and declare what God says in his word. Don't spend all your time talking about man's ideas or opinions. Especially as he talks about coming to debates. Now, we think about debates. I, I honestly would not normally watch a presidential debate. I don't know if I really ever have before. This last week, I watched the presidential debate, if that's what you want to call it. And the only reason I really watched it is because my, my uh, daughters needed to watch it for school and for extra work. And so I, I watched it. And then I watched this thing. I'm scratching my head. Now, let me ask you, if you watch that debate, did it clarify anything in your mind about any position or any ideas? No. no. There was no clarity that was brought about it. What did it do? It created more animosity and more argument and really actually more humor as people just spent hours picking, making fun of all these things that went on. Uh, basically, it sounded like a... Uh, a few comments I heard was like, you know, uh, like a kindergarten teacher listening to two kindergartners kind of argue type of thing. Um, to me, one of the best ideas I kind of like uh, for the next debate, if they're able to have one, is shock collars. <laughs> so <laughs> you put shock collars on each one, and if they talk out of turn, eh, there you go. You know, let's be quiet. I think that was a good, I really like that idea myself. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if they'll actually do that, but I think I, the debate committee should listen to that idea. It might be a good one uh, to help. But you know, when people debate and argue things, there's there's idea of not there's debates that help because you're kind of talking through both sides. But here, Paul says, "Look, don't get involved in all these endless debates and arguments about all the technicalities of, of Scripture. Well, what about this? And what about this?" Simply come back to what is said. What does God say? And he's reminding Timothy about the importance of that. And it tells us, it tells Timothy, and I think this is for us, that we should be students of God's word. Verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. As a worker who has no need, to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. He gives kind of two illustrations. He says, be like that student who seeks the approval of their teachers. Now it's interesting with my children. If you guys, uh, those of you who have had children, you realize that your children sometimes are completely different in the way they act and respond to different things, completely different personalities. So two of my kids, um, one of them just, uh, one of them is just very, very, very smart mentally. I mean, just very smart. And he gets good grades, or he got good grades, and still gets good grades, because he naturally has this photographic memory and is very smart. But I have a daughter who also gets good grades. But it's interesting because she will declare, I am not near as smart as my brother, but I know how to get good grades because I know how to work with teachers. 
And you know the phrase, it's not always what you know, but who you know. Uh, you know, there's some importance to that. Not that she's being deceitful or anything like that, but there is some wisdom in knowing what teachers expect. And so you want to give the teachers what they expect. For instance, my son, who um, should have had a 4.0 because he's smart enough, was easily the smartest kid in his classroom, his SAT stores and other things, he wasn't the valedictorian because when he was in ninth and 10th grade, he had a hard time understanding what a teacher wanted, and he ended up getting like a B plus instead of an A, or he got an A minus instead of an A. Now my daughter, on the other hand, doesn't have necessarily the same book smarts my son does, but she learns what a teacher wants and gives the teacher what they want. Mm -hmm. So right now, she still has a 4.0. Here it says, look, we need to be students who are students and doing things that the teacher approves of. Now, who is our teacher? That idea here and understanding is God. So we need to be like good students doing the work the teachers assign us to. He also gives the idea of an employee or a servant and a master. Employee, employer. We talked about that. Now, a good employee isn't always necessarily the one who works the hardest. But what he does is he does what the employer wants. He seeks to please the employer. And, and Paul says to Timothy, look, do your best like a good student, like a good employee before God. That you're not going to be ashamed in how you do that he says you rightly handle the word of truth. What does it mean to rightly handle the word of truth? The idea of handling the word of truth is I'm going to study God's word and reveal what God's word says rather than take a portion of God's word and make it say something I want it to say. I've said many times I can... I can uphold any type of false teaching or any type of strange idea with the Bible. If I take an obscure passage here or there, or take a sentence or a phrase here or there, I can make it to say pretty much almost anything and try to convince you of that. But that's not rightly handling the word of truth. When I rightly handle the word of truth, I'm going to read what a passage says, and I'm going to compare it with other scripture, and the scripture compares with scripture. I'm going to study God's word. I don't just simply believe what I think it says or come. After the debate this week, I saw people from both sides. I saw uh, Republicans point out that uh, uh, Joe Biden got 11 Pinocchios, they called it. Basically, 11 bold lies that Joe Biden said. Well, I saw the Democrat friends that I have on Facebook have a list of all the lies that President Trump told during the debate. And both sides have these lists, and it's funny because neither one of them said their own candidate lied. They were always picking on the other one for not really telling the full truth. So how do we know what the truth is? The truth is not found by what somebody claims it is. The truth is really found by going to check the facts. So how are the facts determined as you go to see what actually was done? And it's a little bit more complicated because things that are claimed as facts in our society sometimes really aren't facts at all, but the Word of God is clear. And as believers, how do we know who's telling the truth, what way to follow is we go to the Word, we look at the Word, we study the Word as good students. Part of that is avoiding worldly philosophies. Verse 16. But avoid irreverent babble, or it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. That's kind of a strange term. Irreverent babble. The idea of babble in the sense of empty words. Something that goes on and on. Have you ever talked with somebody and they start talking and you zone out, and after about 20 minutes, 
you pick back up and you re feel like you don't miss, you didn't miss a thing in 20 minutes because they just go on and on. That's kind of like um, you know certain uh, as a kid. I, I don't approve of these whatsoever, but as a kid, when my mom would leave in the day, uh, occasionally she would go somewhere and have a little job or something. We were home, and, and uh, occasionally as a family, we'd go and we'd turn on soap operas. And uh, we watched Days of Our Lives as, as a kid. Now, my mom never knew that because she would not be thrilled with that. And I don't endorse it now because even now I look at it and say, oh my word, this is awful. But... <laughs> You know, I found with this is like we would only watch it in the summertime because then we'd be at school the rest of the time. And we'd come back the next summer and it's almost like, did we miss anything over the last eight months? Because it's like they're just rehashing the same things over and over and hardly anything changes except somebody has a new boyfriend or somebody else died or cheated on this one. You know, it doesn't take long. It's like, it's just this endless stuff. And here's what it says, is avoid this Endless kind of babble. This idea of people do a lot of talking. Okay, stop talking and tell me what's really important. Uh, I feel so bad for uh, my, my two daughters right now. Because of the COVID, uh, my daughters love doing dramas, love the plays at school, but they're not sure if they're going to get to do the play at school this year. And so normally they buy a play, they have the performance and the money you spend, or people bring, you know, pay to come to the performance, pays for the plays, because they're pretty expensive, they're like $1,500 or something. Well, what the teacher decided to do this year is to do a free play. Well, she picked Macbeth, Shakespeare. And I hear my daughters practicing at home, and they have such a hard time memorizing because basically my dog one daughter gets so obsessed she goes he spends like this whole paragraph saying one simple thing like it's a beautiful day outside instead of saying it's a beautiful day outside he's got she's got to memorize this whole paragraph that basically says that but you can't understand it says it because of the words that are being used and there's a lot of times where there's just a lot of you know wording and argument and all these different things all says look avoid that the Word of God is really relatively simple. It shouldn't be complicated. But it said it'll cause people to fall into more ungodliness because you're coming up with all these different ideas. Instead, or then it goes on further, verse 17, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are, who are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. So he gives an example. He says there's these two guys, and they're declaring that the resurrection has already taken place. And what he's doing is it's hurting the faith of many people. He says avoid these kind of extra things or these odd things or new doctrines or new beliefs. You know, I think about this. And please understand, I have nothing against prophecy whatsoever. I think prophecy is, is in the Bible, it's very good. But I've experienced in the past with this. If I were to say, we're going to have a three-night prophecy conference, where we're going to look at current events and how they apply to the Bible and what they might mean and what this might mean, and if I were going to have a three-day Bible study conference to say, look, we're going to study the Bible, and how it can practically change and transform your life today. And if I were to advertise both of these, the same, and put the same advertising, I pretty much guarantee you that I would have so many more people come to the prophecy conference than I would to the Bible study conference. Why? Because the prophecy conference seemed new and exciting and neat and the what ifs and the wonder. Nothing wrong with some of that. But really, true life, true change, true transformation comes from the Bible study that transforms our daily life today. So Paul described that elsewhere as itching ears. We want to hear these new ideas and new thoughts. And he says, wait a minute, let's not do that. Let's come back to the foundations of the Word of God. And that's where we see letter D, that we need to trust God's Word. Verse 19. 
But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now, it talks about God's firm foundation stand. Some commentators believe he's talking about the church stand for the truth. He says it's like an inscription, Paul says, an inscription in stone. It's not that you have a chalkboard that constantly changes. God's word is firm. The church, the declaration of truth should be firm. And really it goes on further in a sense. It should be simple and it should be based on these two things. That the Lord knows those, those who are his. What we have in Christ through salvation. And then also the idea for purity. He comes back and says, look, God's word does not change. It's like this inscription and tone, and the foundation of it is who we are in God as believers and how God wants us to live in purity and holiness. Those things should be the emphasis because that's what the word of God declares. In conclusion, I want you to ask yourself these questions first. Are you living in light of future hope? When you live each day, do you understand, you know what, this life is not always easy. This world is not our home. We're strangers and pilgrims. I'm willing to endure. I'm willing to suffer for eternal glory. Secondly, are you a true believer? I would like to think that every one of you is a true believer. That every one of you has understood that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for your sins. The only way to have it is to humble yourself. Say, I can't do it on my own. My good works can't get me to heaven. But to trust in Jesus Christ. To choose to follow him with your life. It's not about religion. It's not about going to church. But being a true believer. And lastly, are you a student of the Word of God? Are you a person who studies and reads and, and thinks about and understands or, or do you just kind of come to, to church and you hear and you go home and live however you want and you come back to church and hear? Let's be students of the Word. I want you to go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. Just take a moment at this time to let God's word and his truth speak to you this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth that Paul has presented and uh, God, I try as much as possible in clarity and wisdom through your Spirit to present your word. It's nothing spectacular, it's nothing vibrant, but it's so powerful because it's your word. I thank you that we can have hope in you because of that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to have a